to introduce today's webinar. It's called The Blackest Sheep, Understanding Stigmatization of Borderline Personality Disorder. Suzanne herself, at, since discovering the path to recovery, has become passionate mental health advocate, especially around borderline personality disorder. I have heard uh, Suzanne speak in the past and I was really impressed with her presentation. Never shying away from opportunities to question conventional thinking about mental illness and sharing her own lived experience. So it is really a joy to have Suzanne with us today. I am going to pass it over to Stop Share and to um, talk a little bit about the Mentimeter. So I'm just going to repost in our chat uh, some of the details about Mentimeter and then I'm just going to pass it over to Suzanne with a welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen green. Um, and of course, I didn't have it. That's the joy of like, zoom and wanting to share all these different things is like having it all prepped and ready to go while you scroll through everything. Um, so yeah, I just have this question, uh, just to kind of understand where everybody is with their understanding or their thoughts about borderline personality disorder. So um, if you go to mentimeter.com and then you enter that code at the top, 9700061, um, it will ask you to just kind of three words, you don't have to put three, but three words you think of when you first think of like borderline personality disorder. Um, and then I will actually, we'll go back and revisit it. So you have the whole time of the video that we watch in order to enter things in. So don't feel like you have to be rushed. The video is four minutes. Um, so you'll have a bit of time to kind of think about that if you'd like. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, I will do my best to bleep the, um, the profanity. It's just one word. Um, and I just show it as a way to kind of introduce myself and my story so you can understand how I am, or not how, but why I'm here where I am today. Um, so. Doing great, Suzanne. It's not easy to juggle all those things. You're doing great. I know, it's like, there's so many different, let's get that. Oh, you know what? I totally forgot to click off the share my share my audio, which I feel like would be pretty important to the video. Okay. Hope is a funny thing, and like misery is everywhere around us. The more we look for it, the more we find it. In February of 2016, I was at the lowest point I'd ever been in my entire life. My life was filled with darkness and pain. It strangled my mind, no longer allowing me to see the options or choices I had to support my mental health. The pain was so extreme and exhaustive that I felt my only option was to end my life. I don't remember being rushed to the ER that I was still alive and still in extreme amounts of pain. In June 2016, the Parliament of Canada passed federal legislation that allowed adults to request medical assisted dying. After a brief yet unhelpful stay at the hospital, I had come to the conclusion that based on my long history of mental illness and the extreme emotional pain that caused, I could be granted this way out of living. I had to ask myself, if I only have a few months left to live, how would I spend it? What or who was I gonna miss? What did I wanna do one last time? Or what did I wanna experience that I haven't done yet? So I made a point to do something that brought me joy every day, whether it was laughs with friends the smell of a secondhand bookstore, the softness of my cat's belly, reading in the sunlight, or just eating my mom's cooking. Slowly, the moments of joy and happiness began to roll into one another, and I began to realize 
that by having placed my hope in death, I had somehow stumbled upon hope in living. And then my hope grew. It became the possibility that my life could be different. That I could find moments of lightness and sweetness in between the moments of sadness and pain. I was asked today if I thought it was going to get easier. Today I said no. But I know my answer will be different either tomorrow or next week. This is just how mental illness works. It confuses the mind until your hope is lost. I know my hope sometimes hides behind the clouds of my depression and anxiety, but I know it's always there, waiting for me like sunshine on a cloudy day or spring flowers after months of fallen snow. I also know not everyone is lucky to have the confidence that their hope is out there waiting for them. To you, I ask that you have faith in my faith that your hope will return one day. And if nothing else, please know that you're not alone and that the world would be a lot less wonderful without you in it. Okay. So yeah, I just want to show that video because it kind of just uh, speaks to my journey. Um, and then I'm going to take us back to Mentimeter just to see what everyone has shared. So this is the word cloud that you guys all generated, um, which is pretty awesome. So trauma seems to be a really big one. Um, misunderstood, suffering, pain, stigma. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, awesome. This is so amazing. Um, thank you. Dramatic. Yeah. Distress. Difficulties. Oh, I like oscillating. That's awesome. <laughs> I think that's my favorite response so far. Um, so yeah, thank you all for that. It just kind of gives me an idea of, um, yeah, like where everyone is at um, with regards to this disorder. So I'm going to do that. Um, share my window. Go into my presentation. All right, thanks. Um, so um, that video kind of like, sorry, I'm a little sniffly because anytime I show it to other people, it really affects me. But if I watch it by myself, I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. And it's just that like vulnerability piece that really can kind of like, oh God. Um, anyway, so in 2016, I was diagnosed with uh, BPD after struggling with mental health challenges since my childhood. As a result, I was able to get the appropriate treatment and recover from the diagnosis. I have to admit that when I first heard about borderline personality disorder in university after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I did silently wonder and was actually terrified that I did have this disorder. Terrified because of the way the disorder was described in the textbook and the stigma attached to it. When I got this diagnosis, and more importantly, when I started working with individuals with BPD as a peer support worker, and saw the implication that this diagnosis has. I was driven to learn more about it so that I could better advocate for my clients and myself. Uh, BPD is especially complicated, so I will only be touching on broad concepts. Uh, so feel free to ask questions in the Q&A if you'd like more information, and I will try to do my best to answer, no guarantees. Um, some people may know about BPD through TV and movies, fatal attraction, single white female, not really the type of person you'd want over for dinner or in your life. 
Uh, but these portrayals cherry pick and exaggerate symptoms for the, the sake of the story without thought for or compassion for the individuals with this disorder. We know that it is important how and when the media portrays individuals, especially to those that have no experience with the individuals with this disorder. However, it can be just as damaging to the individuals that have the disorder. It teaches us that we're dangerous, unlovable, and I can say from personal experience, this internal stigma is some of the hardest to get over. Um, I'd also just like to mention that this is my understanding based on my own personal research uh, and my own personal experience, and it is not academically peer re reviewed. Um, when looking into the research around BPD, there seems to be agreement on three different themes. People with BPD are manipulative, attention seeking, and are untreatable. Up to 89% of clinicians thought people with BPD were manipulative. Uh, the smaller words around the are direct quotes from clinicians in the, dis, in the um, studies describing the individuals with BPD. Um, we know that stigma translates into prejudice and discrimination. So it's concerning that the professionals that are supposed to help and support us have negative attitudes and beliefs about us. It affects our care. This has real implications for the treatment of people with BPD as clinicians in the study show less empathy and optimism for those with BPD. Some research proposes that this can actually make symptoms worse, prolong treatment, or even go so far as to re-traumatize the individual. The discrimination is real. Today, some clinicians refuse to treat individuals with BPD, and it is still an exclusion criteria for some mental health or housing programs. Um, so let's explore what BPD is and how it develops to understand why these labels are harmful and ultimately incorrect. Um, so personality dis disorders overall are defined as someone who has difficulty in dealing with relationships and social situations, handling emotions and thoughts, understanding how and why their behavior is causing problems, and finds it hard to change to suit different situations. Estimates show that around 11% of the population have one of the 10 personality disorders. Knowing that, what is BPD? Broadly speaking, BPD is uh, difficulties with emotional regulation, impulse control, interpersonal relationships, and self-image. The way I like to describe it to people is that it's learned maladaptive thoughts and behaviors and a lack of skills to cope in the world. Um, I just want to um, I just want to talk first uh, uh, just about traits versus disorder. We probably all have any of the criteria of any of the personality disorders. Uh, but remember, it is only becomes a disorder when it interferes with our daily functioning or quality of life. I mean, who isn't afraid of abandonment? Um, but according to the DSM, you need five of the nine criteria in order to get a diagnosis. Uh, so fear of abandonment. People with BPD are often terrified of being abandoned or left alone. Even something as simple as a partner being late from work or spending time with other people can flare up the symptoms. We will beg, cling, start fights, track loved ones' movements, or even physically block the person from leaving. Unfortunately, this behavior tends to have the opposite effect, driving others away. Unstable relationships. People with BPD tend to have relationships that are intense and short-lived. We can fall in love quickly and intensely, maybe believing that the new person will give us some sort of sense of worth or self. Unfortunately, this is just not how self-worth works, and we become quickly disappointed when this does not happen. I have heard words like emotional whiplash as a result of the swing between idea ideation, love, and devaluation, hate. Uh, this is also known as splitting. It's living in a world with no grays, all or nothing, good or bad, black and white unclear or shifting self-image. When you have BPD, your sense of self is typically unstable. Sometimes we feel good about ourselves, but other times we hate ourselves. Oftentimes we don't know what we want out of life and frequently change aspects of our life. Think of being a social communing, chameleon, changing to fit the environment and people around us. Impulsive self-destructive behaviors. We may engage in harmful behaviors, uh, especially when we're upset. We may impulsively spend money we don't have, binge, eat, drive recklessly, shoplift, engage in risky sex, or overdo it with drugs or alcohol. These risky behaviors may help to, to feel better in the moment, but they often hurt us in the long run. You'll see in my presentation that I talk a lot about language choice and the effect it can have on an individual. In this context, I'm working on changing my language around the term self-destructive to self-defeating behaviors. 
as it has more of a focus on the ability to overcome the behaviors. So self-harm, uh, suicide, suicidal behavior and deliberate self-harm are common in individuals with BP. Suicidal behavior includes thinking about suicide, uh, making uh, gestures or threats, or actually carrying out a suicide attempt. Self-harm encompasses all other attempts to hurt yourself without suicidal intent. Common forms of self-harm include cutting and burning, food restriction, but also substance use can be seen as a form of self-harm. Extreme emotional swings. Unstable emotions and moods are common with people with BPD. One moment you may feel happy and the next despondent. Little things that other people brush off can send you into an emotional tailspin. Uh, mood swings are intense, but they tend to pass more quickly than the emotional swings of depression or bipolar disorder, usually lasting a few minutes or hours. Chronic feelings of emptiness. People with BPD often talk about feeling empty as if there's a hole or void inside them. At the extreme, we may feel as if we're nothing or nobody. This feeling is uncomfortable, so we may try to fill the void with things like food, drugs, sex, um, but nothing's really satisfying. Explosive anger. We may struggle with intense anger and have a short temper. We may also have trouble controlling ourselves once the fuse is lit, yelling, throwing things, or becoming completely consumed by the rage. It's important to note that this anger isn't always directed outwards. We may spend a lot of time feeling angry at ourselves, and this may be where the self-harm and self-defeating behaviors come into play. Um, feeling suspicious or out of touch with reality, we can struggle with paranoia or uh, suspicious thoughts about others' motives. When under stress, we may even lose touch with reality and experience known as dissociation. We may feel foggy, spaced out, or as if we're outside our own body, or in the case of derealization, that our environment is alien or surreal. Since a person needs five of the nine criteria to get a diagnosis, this means that there are 256 combinations in order to get the diagnosis. Two people with the same diagnosis could have only one of the same uh, criteria. So it's unfair to paint us all with the same brush. This is why uh, stereotypes are so dehumanizing. Uh, now that we have a definition, let's talk about some of the numbers and why it's critical that we understand and challenge the stigma around it. Uh, the common number shown around the in, uh, internet is that BPD affects 1.6% of the population. Some research notes that it has a lifetime prevalence of 5.9%. I personally wonder about the 1.6% given that we know of stigma and people not seeking mental health services and due to the fact that 40% uh, of BPD is originally misdiagnosed. Uh, it was traditionally thought that the prevalence was higher in women with women making up 75% of those with the disorder. However, we should consider that women are more likely to seek treatment and that in our culture, women are seen as emotional creatures, often considered quote unquote hysterical. Since BPD is about emotional regulation, this could account for the tendency upon professionals to diagnose more women with BPD. Conversely, research has shown that men tend to get a diagnosis of PTSD, antisocial personality disorder, or major depressive disorder. So the research is actually beginning to reflect that it isn't a gender specific disorder. Of that 1.6%, 10% will die by suicide. This is 50 times the rate of the general population. 70% uh, of us will attempt suicide or self-harm. And it's reported that up to 80% of us will have a history of trauma. Um, stats are great, uh, but what does that mean in concrete numbers? So if we use Canada as a case study, as of 2019, Canada has just over uh, 37.5 million people. If we use the 1.6%, uh, that means that just over 600,000 Canadians have BPD and that we'll actually use lose 60,144 Canadians to this disease. Uh, finally, individuals with BPD make up about 20% of the inpatient world and 10% of the outpatient world by mental outpatient world by mental health therapists. So overall, about 15% of those accessing mental health services. Knowing that there's over 200 classifications of mental um, illnesses, individuals with BPD definitely represent a good proportion of those seeking services. This is why it is critical to start to challenge the stigma around BPD. We're common, it can be a life or death disorder, and our care providers have negative beliefs that affect our treatment and care. 
So through education, we can work to reduce the stigma. Uh, Marsha Linehan, the person who came up with the first biosocial theory, shares that BPD is primarily a disorder of emotional dysregulation and emerges, emerges from transactions between individuals with biological vulnerabilities and specific environmental influences. Uh, or in other words, personality disorders are biologically determined personality traits reacting to emotional or environmental stimuli. So if we look at the biology first, uh, we all have inborn traits. Think introvert versus extrovert. We are somewhere on the spectrum. Inborn traits organize uh, a person's approach to the world and determine how we learn about the world. People with BPD are thought to be born with high negative affectivity. Think along the lines of high fear and anger and low levels of effortful control, so more impulsive. Approximately 15 to 20% of individuals are born highly sensitive physically and or emotionally. Um, so just like some people are sensitive to smells or noises, some people are sensitive to emotions. Uh, this has actually been found not unique to humans. Um, BPD is five to 10 times more common among those who have a first, first degree relative with the disorder. Whether this is 100% due to nature is fuzzy because there's that confounding factor of the chaos of being uh, raised by individuals with mental health challenges. That said, we know from twin studies that 40 to 60% of BPD is predict uh, predicted by genetic factors. Uh, it's important to note that it is not an inherited trait like eye color, but can develop given the right conditions, putting those with certain genetic vulnerabilities at a higher risk of developing the disorder. Uh, genetic marker, chromosome nine. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand the science behind this one. Um, and I kinda wanna do a bit more research on it. However, Driscoll et, et al. did a study about genome-wide linkage to study the region uh, that influences the manifestation of BPD features. Evidence for linkage was found on chromosomes one, four, nine, and 18 with the highest link in chromosome nine. Um, our brain. Uh, we're lucky now to have studies which have done brain scans on individuals with BPD. Uh, from them, we can see that individuals with BPD have different brain structure and function than those without, specifically in two main areas, the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system is made up of the amygdala. People with BPD have amygdalas that are noticeably smaller and may even have undergone atrophy. The smaller the amygdala, the more overactive it is. This means when people with BPD have an emotion, they do so more intensely and return to baseline or cool down uh, much, uh, it takes much longer. The hippocampus is associated with memory, spatial orientation, and emotional reaction. It's like the body's data processor. The hippocampus uh, decides the correct emotional response, approach or avoid. For people with BPD, the hippocampus is in a state of hypoarousal. It constantly misinterprets threats and relays faulty messages back to the amygdala. This means people with BPD are more likely to encounter other people and the world around them as threatening, even when this, even when this may not be the intent or the reality. Studies have shown that people with BPD have a hard time interpreting neutral faces often and often see them as expressing negative emotion. This is one I still struggle with today. Hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access is a complex name for three interconnected glands. Um, it's primarily responsible for the body's production of cortisol, cortisol being a natural chemical release during times of stress. Extreme stress, especially experienced in childhood and over long periods of time, can lead to abnormal levels of production of uh, cortisol, which is seen in individuals with BPD. The high levels of cortisol affect stem cells, which can inhibit connections between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex, and can hardwire pathways between the amygdala and hippocampus to predispose someone to constantly be in the fight or flight response. Um, in short, BPD has been uh, associated with excessive activity in parts of the brain that control the experience and expression of emotion, specifically the limbic system, which deals with fear and anger. This may be why emotional instability is a symptom of BPD. The prefrontal cortex affects our rationality and decision-making, and it also inhibits our primal nature. 
People with BPD have prefrontal cortexes that are inactive and inefficient. Uh, this may be one of the reasons for the impulsivity symptom of BPD. Serotonin transporter, this is another one I don't fully understand all the science behind. Uh, I'm definitely not a biologist. Uh, however, the serotonin transporter is responsible for transporting serotonin from the uh, synaptic cleft back to the presynaptic neuron. Uh, so there is evidence of a reduction in serotonin in the serotonin transporter's function in individuals with BPD. Um, I also would like to just make a note about trauma. Um, about 80% of us have a history of trauma. Um, and we know that physical and psychological trauma causes changes to the brain. It's hard to say exactly if the difference in the brain's functioning with someone with, BP, with BPD is a direct cause or a consequence of the trauma itself. Maybe it's a combination of the two. The predisposition is there and the trauma amplifying the difference. If we think of the predisposition as on a spectrum, maybe some individuals are born with brain differences and maybe some aren't quite there yet and the trauma is the event that pushes the brain to change. Research shows that trauma puts individuals at risk for developing any mental illness and can affect a person's physical health. If you're interested in this, I would suggest you look up uh, something called ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experience. Um, so risky business. When we put all of this together, people with BPD are set up uh, for emotional vulnerability, which comprises of high negative affectivity as a baseline, sensitivity to emotional stimuli, intense response to emotional stimuli, and longer to return to baseline. The example I like to give is that we're sort of born as a drag racing car next to people who are born as station wagons. Sometimes we, something that we just don't get a uh, choice about. Um, and drag cars have sensitive steering and gas, which leads to speed and the easy ability to crash. Uh, on top of that, our brakes are not great because they require a parachute, which means it doesn't happen very quickly. Um, in short, we're expecting people with a compromised brain structure to function at the same level as the general population. Uh, it's like expecting someone with the wrong tool to be able to accomplish a task as quickly as someone with the right tool. Um, I really like this quote from Marsha Linehan. People with BPD are like people with third degree burns all over their bodies. Lacking emotional skin, they feel agony at the slightest touch or movement. If it wasn't enough, uh, 96 of uh, people with BPD have... Uh, 6% of individuals with BPD uh, will have a mood disorder during their lifetime, with the lifetime depression being reported at 71 to 83%. When BPD is successfully treated, the other disorders often improve too, but the reverse isn't always true. For example, you can may successfully treat the symptoms of depression and still struggle with BPD. It's like trying to treat the symptoms of illness, but never addressing the illness itself. Um, so you're just too sensitive. The social aspect of the theory is that the experience of invalidation of our emotional states. Our emotional states are diminished, you're too sensitive, demeaned, you're being dramatic, or discounted. You're exaggerating. That isn't true. The message is that we shouldn't feel the way we feel, and there is something wrong with us feeling how we feel. This teaches us to distrust and or disbelieve our emotional experiences. We also experience punishment for expression of painful emotions. Shut up or I'll give you something to cry about. This only serves to intensify the emotional response, ups the ante, which leads to extreme emotions and actions in order to be heard. This actually reinforces emotional escalation in order to get our needs met. It's the intermittent uh, reinforcements which makes it so difficult to stop this learning coping mechanisms. We learn it doesn't always work, but maybe, maybe this time it will. Uh, Linehan talks about few, like a few different invalidating environments, the self-explanatory abuse of home, the poor fit, a sensitive child born into a family of logical, rational thinkers, uh, the chaotic home, parents who may have experienced an invalidating childhood themselves, um, may have mental illness or substance use problems, financially unstable, move a lot, family um, conflicts or separation or loss of a caregiver. Um, society as well. Invalidation doesn't only come from the home environment, it can also come from the school, sports, social media, or a systematic oppression. You could have the most supportive caretakers, but if you are invalidated everywhere else, 
your experience and emotions question, you'll be at risk for developing this disorder. Um, so the sad part about this is that it becomes sort of a feedback loop when, with both feeding into the other, which only makes the circumstances work. I'm biologically sensitive, my environment invalidates me, which increases my emotional response and actions in an environment that continues to invalidate me. Um, so the outcome can mean that we don't learn to accurately label or trust our emotions, which leads to an inability or lack of skills to regulate them. Dan Siegel uses the phrase, name it, tame it. You may have heard of this. Naming our emotions tends to decrease the intensity of them. If you're unable to name the emotion, you are unable to decrease its intensity. And a person who already experienced emotions so intensely, this can actually be a deadly combination. If we're unable to label our emotions and have an underactive prefrontal cortex, it becomes hard to problem solve emotional states to avoid or self soothe extreme emotions. If a person learns not to trust their internal experience, this can also affect their self image. Individuals learn to search the environment on how to think, feel, and act. Um, BPD makes people hyper vigilant, which means we are always on the lookout for signs of rejection and are extremely sensitive to emotional nuances. We're constantly checking the social environment for feedback. This can contribute to the experience of emptiness or a lack of self image, as we're constantly looking to the outside for cues on how to exist. When no one takes our needs seriously or questions our needs, we learn extreme ways of getting others to take them seriously. It goes with learning to up the ante and get someone to listen. This can lead to self-harm or suicide attempts to express our pain. I think this is also why we see big numbers of individuals with BPD, with BPD going to the emergency departments. We're trying to get acknowledgement that our pain is real and intense, no different than if someone had a broken bone. Unfortunately, what we face at the hospital office often does the opposite and invalidates our pain, feeding into the cycle yet again. It can lead to substance misuse to, uh, to escape difficult emotions and self-soothe. If a person doesn't trust their experience, it can lead to development of self-invalidation. I should be able to do this. I'm broken. Nobody loves me. What is wrong with me? Individuals with BPD report feeling shame 50% of the time. Think about that for a second. Imagine spending half of your existence ashamed of your actions, emotions, and thoughts. However, there's hope. There are treatment options. There are a few ways to support recovery. Medication. Currently, there's no medication on the market that treats BPD. Uh, medications help the symptoms of depression, anxiety, or impulsivity. Um, but not the root cause of BPD. When BPD is successfully treated, the other disorders often improve, um, but the reverse isn't true. Some therapies um, include uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps individuals identify distorted beliefs and thought patterns. Schema-focused therapy helps to reframe the way people view themselves through the poor sense of self. Mentalization-based treatment was designed for BPD. Uh, mentalization is the ability to understand the thoughts and feelings which underlines behavior. Um, it brings together aspects of psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, systemic, and ecological approaches. The goal is to increase mentalization capacity, which can improve affect regulation, reducing suicidality and self-harm, and strengthening interpersonal relationships. Two therapies I can speak directly to are uh, psychodynamic therapy, which focuses on unconscious processes that manifest in a person's present behavior. The goal of psychodynamic therapy is the self-awareness and understanding of the influence on the past on current behavior. I was able to attend a four months uh, intensive psychodynamic group therapy um, from this, I was able to gain insight about my own behaviors by witnessing others engage in the same behavior, uh, get feedback about behaviors in a safe, supportive environment, uh, and it was an avenue to uh, try new skills. As with any therapy, it required hard work with lots of vulnerability and openness to getting feedback and looking at what I contributed to the situation. The problem is that programs like these are expensive to run with a large quote unquote cost per person in the program. 
So the outcome actually ends up saving money for the healthcare system in the reduction of future hospitalizations and uh, emergency room visits. Uh, DBT, developed by Marsha Linehan, teaches skills for mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, interpersonal effectiveness. And these can bridge the gap between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. If we think of BPD as lacking skills to navigate the world, then this is learning new skills that the general public typically learns naturally. There is good prognosis, and in some cases, better than any other mental illness. 50 to 75% of symptoms reduce as we get older. Some symptoms resolve on their own as the person ages. And I would argue naturally learns more socially acceptable coping mechanisms and ways to get needs met. In short, we learn the language. Uh, Zanari, a researcher that has focused on longitudinal studies of individuals with BPD showed that after 16 years, 99% were in remission. Remission was defined as two or more years without any uh, significant symptoms, and that 60% had been in recovery for years. Uh, they or she defined recovery as symptomatic remission and good social and full-time vocational functioning. So let's uh, focus, circle back to the stigma. The really sad part of these stereotypes is that they become part of a self-fulfilling process, prophecy when accessing mental health services. Oftentimes these behaviors come from a place of trying to cope and find connection. However, this can lead to frustration and distancing from others, including mental health professionals, which then creates another invalidating situation, creating more behaviors. All of this feeds into each other, creating a cycle that can actually re-traumatize individuals. So when I show up to ER for a suicide attempt, I've just confirmed the clinician's view that I'm attention-seeking and manipulative. The clinician distances and invalidates my pain. Because I'm hypervigilant, I'm going to pick up on this, creating more emotional pain, which heightens my emotions even more. And then into this never-ending cycle we go until I either take my life or find some other way out on my own. So I hope you'll agree with me that these labels are concerning. Uh, now that we have a little more education about BPD, let's revisit them. Uh, manipulation has the connotation of malice or some sinister ploy. Uh, the label manipulation makes it seem like we have some kind of control over all our actions and that there's some sort of malicious intent behind them. However, our actions are really just desperate attempts to cope with extremely painful circumstances. We're trying to meet needs but do not have the skills to get our needs met. Or using old skills we learned when we were young facing extremely challenging or abusive circumstances that did get our needs met then. However, now we're adults and out, and out of those extreme environments and it's like everyone is speaking another language. Um, we're inexperienced, but also resourceful as we try all different ways to get our needs met. It just happens that some of these ways aren't traditional or socially sanctioned methods, but we will get there. Marsha Linehan states suicide behavior is a response to unbearable suffering. These behaviors have become learned coping mechanisms for when we feel like there aren't any other ways left to cope with the emotional pain. Or it may be a method to express emotional pain in a way more easily understood by the person. Or it could be a distraction from high levels of emotional distress. People with BPD experience emotions much more intensely and for longer than the general public. Our brains are not wired the same and we do not have the same control over our actions. We are impulsive, when it's, especially when facing extreme pain. Oftentimes an impulsive thought becomes an action, one we often wish we could take back. We aren't so much seeking uh, attention as we are seeking connection. We just don't know how to express this clearly and we learn growing up in these chaotic environments to get our needs met with extremes. We don't have the understanding or language to articulate our need for connection yet. We don't know how to communicate our agony and do it in a way that unfortunately doesn't support social bonds. I really like this quote by um, Dr. April Foreman. Your brain is screaming at you to have its needs met. It's screaming to be understood. It's screaming to be valid. So you do some pretty wacky um, poop. That's not the word to use, but that's the word I'm going to use. Wacky poop in order to get the environment to respond to your brain. It's not untreatable. Remission and recovery is possible. Myself and people I know are proof of this. In the same way, individuals with depression can't change their moods on a whim. Individuals with BPD need time and space to learn new skills to support their recovery. 
I think it's important to remember that the behaviors are not the person, the behaviors are the disorder. Our actions are part of a symptomology that hurt is a part of a symptomology. The hurt these actions can cause is a consequence of the symptom. I'm not trying to minimize or excuse the hurtful actions that I myself or others have engaged in, but it may be helpful to remind ourselves not to take it personally and remember it's biology. It was only through self-awareness and accepting responsibility for past mistakes that I was able to change maladaptive thoughts and behaviors. I have finally learned the language to communicate my needs. This was a slow process and it required a lot of trial and error. We know that to change behavior takes time, especially ones we have been practicing for 10 plus years. While these symptoms may represent themselves over and over, it can be frustrating. But I believe this frustration comes from feelings of powerlessness, inadequacy to fix the problem from supporters and healthcare staff. A patient's self-harming can impact a healthcare professional's thoughts. All our work is wasted, I'm a failure which affects their behavior, the nurses withdraw or avoids, and thus reinforces the patient's negative belief about themselves. I'm a bad person, I deserve to be punished, no one loves me. However, there's hope because clinicians do want more skills to support individuals with BPD. And studies have shown that after training, empathy and optimism has gone up in clinicians. After learning about um, BPD, you may have noticed the term borderline personality disorder doesn't really tell us much about the disorder. Um, it was not introduced into the DSM until 1980, so it's relatively new. Um, however, tracing back the term borderline, it was first written about by Adolf Stern, who used it to describe patients that didn't quite fit neatly anywhere else. That said, this name isn't very descriptive, and perhaps this is part of the reason it's so easy to forget that our behaviors are not always things we have the tools to control. Um, Valerie Poor of the Treatment and Research Advancement National Association for Personality Disorders um, has this quote, the name BPD is confusing, imparts no relevant or descriptive information and reinforces existing stigma. Um, so this organization campaigned unsuccessfully to change the name and classification of BPD in the DSM-5. Um, however, borderline personality disorder remains unchanged and it was not moved from the personality disorders um, to a new classification of trauma and stress, uh, and stress related with other disorders like PTSD, acute stress and adjustment disorder. Currently international diagnosis is based on the uh, international classification of diseases. Um, they use uh, emotionally unstable personality disorder as the overarching term with impulsive and borderline subtypes. Some other names floating around um, are emotional regulation disorder, uh, emotional dysregulation disorder, impulse disorder, interpersonal regulatory disorder, and the controversial complex PTSD, uh, controversial just because only 80% of us have a history of trauma. Research on BPD is strikingly uh, sparse compared to other mental illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But as we represent a big portion of those, um, but as discussed, we represent a big portion of those access and services. Taking a look at the brain and behaviors research funding, we can see that BPD is not getting research funding proportional to surveillance. Uh, BPD is associated with tremendous emotion and financial burdens to individuals, families, and society. Because of this, we need more information about the disorder, more research, more research dollars. Um, so through education of ourselves and others, we can enc uh, encourage the growth of compassion and understanding of the complexity of BPD. We can be allies and advocate for change. We know that allies are important for change within a system and society. Big societal changes happen when allies stand up and back those experiencing discrimination. We have to challenge these stereotypes when they arrive, when they arise. We know that what is thought of as manipulation and attention seeking behaviors come from a lack of language and skills to get basic needs for connection met. We know that to change behavior takes time, especially once we've been practicing for long. Um, these symptoms may represent themselves over and over and it can be frustrating, but we know that it's not untreatable. We have research that shows this. It just takes time with many stumbles along the way. Uh, based on Zenari's definition of recovery, I can say that I have recovered from my BPD diagnosis. 
I definitely will be challenged by traits for the rest of my life. In fact, just yesterday, one came up. Um, but we can advocate for change with our language choices. We know that language is powerful and we can change, affect change by the words we use. We need to adopt recovery focused language. Uh, this is why I use the term individual with BPD, individual lives with BPD, individual has BPD, not borderline client or borderline patient or the borderlines or cluster Bs or they are borderline um, or use the term I am borderline. Um, we are so much more than a diagnosis. Imagine if I only thought of myself as being asthmatic or being diabetic. BPD is a biological condition just like any other physical ailment and no one should be defined by their illnesses. However, I do wanna recognize that some people with BPD do identify and prefer to call themselves borderline or being BPD. I personally have thoughts on this based on what I know about BPD in my experience, but it's not my or anyone else's place to police how individuals decide to identify. Um, another example of this is died by suicide rather than commit suicide. The term commit is from a time when it was a crime. We don't say, oh, they committed a heart attack. This is an important distinction. The disease is what terminates the life, not the person. It's the same with completed suicide. It puts a positive slant on a tragic outcome. It associates a suicide attempt with failure. Again, um, we're not gonna say they completed a heart attack. Uh, finally, empathy and validation. My personal initial response when I hear about self-harm or suicidal intent is to validate the pain. How much pain must a person be in to choose to hurt themselves or no longer want to live? I once had a therapist describe suicidal intent as homicidal intent turned inward. It was the sort of shock I needed to re-examine these thoughts, to see them as outside myself and really understand the extreme pain self-blame and loathing I had for myself, much like someone who wants to murder someone else. I needed to change my thinking and develop the self-compassionate mentality. I try to remember that I can't judge a person on the choices they make if I don't know the options they had to choose from. This is an idea that we can all remember when interacting with all humans. So let's start being the change we want to see. Uh, what I like to say is basically spread kindness like glitter. Um, I would like to end this presentation with an acknowledgement of the immense amount of privilege I have had in my recovery, um, from having a safe place to live, to having financial support from my parents while I was on disability, to having access to many mental health resources that come from living in a big city, and having public health care. And um, these are just some of my resources that I got, and that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Suzanne. What a what a whirlwind and wonderful presentation. I really thank you very much. Uh, that is, I I guess you know some of the joys of having people with lived experience uh, are expressed in this presentation because I think we can all speak so much about things, but unless you really have that experience of living living yourself with um, you know things it's just it's just so much more impactful i am also really impressed with your you know just your your call for us to be kind i think one of the things i really picked up was we never know what somebody's living with and and we never know what people's choices are and it's kind of it's just essential to remember that isn't it um yes so yeah so thank you um so well let's go to some of the uh, some of the um some of the comments uh, and I'm just trying to post a link to for feedback so hopefully that goes out to you in a moment I don't know for some reason my little posty thing is not is not working but we had one really uh, many many questions but I just do want to I promise this human Jim that we would come back to it but he asks is borderline personality uh, really a disorder or more so a way of coping that may at times be viewed as maladapt maladaptive. Perhaps the world is maladjusted and many are struggling to seek sense, comfort and control in the chaos. Being unheard and unappreciated and not validated can lead somebody, someone towards borderline personality disorder. And maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a comment, but I would really love to invite uh, your comments on that. 
Uh, I would probably agree with that. Um, I think that there's people now writing about how um, we like creating mental illness um, with depression and anxiety by the society that we have. Um, so it would not surprise me, um, especially if we look historically, there's probably a lot more individuals with it. And I think it is probably a confirmation with environmental aspects being part of it. Um, I think that it definitely, the environment influences people. So if we change the environment, <laughs> then um, the, I guess the disorder wouldn't, wouldn't be there. Thank you so much. So I do appreciate that comment. I, right. I, I agree. But. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think sometimes in our in our in our view we have we have something that's very different that we're trying to help people, we're trying to support people, often we're trying to fix something. But sometimes our environment is so very powerful that uh, it it hurts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please have a look. Um, you know, Gloria, just add so powerful. Thank you so much for incredible sharing. You make the world so much better place. Excellent job, Matthew adds. May adds, thank you. Absolutely brilliant personality, Victoria Maxwell adds. Thank you so much. Gail adds, uh, thank you. That was heartwarming and very informative. Fantastic, Lauren says. Thank you so much for that. Your content and slides are so enriching. Tony adds, thanks so much for sharing. Kelly adds, thank you for sharing your experience and providing such great information. Moving, genuine. Thank you for presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. So you can see clearly um, you have touched so many people here this morning um, in terms of the content. And it's a little bit, yeah. And Matthew adds, it takes a lot of courage. I would totally concur. I think sometimes this particular topic is a bit taboo sometimes. And we further alienate individuals who are living in, you know, with such pain and, and chaos sometimes. Fantastic presentation. Um, yes. What a vast amount of knowledge Sue adds that you shared. Thank you for sharing <laughs> your personal experience uh, and trying so well to tying it so well to the literature. Well done, very informative. Yeah, uh, great presentation. Erin uh, asks, uh, could we have access to the presentation and slides? Yes, please. So dear Manny, who is working in the background, uh, will uh, likely put up the presentation in a couple of days. Just takes a wee moment for that to happen. Um, but if you go back on our PSYrehab.ca, um, yeah, uh, kindly Suzanne's given us permission to share those slides and, your, and the information. So you'll see the full recording uh, with the slides. So absolutely. Yeah. Carly adds, uh, I'd like, uh, thank you. And I especially would like your thoughts on language and up-to-date brain science will be great to bring into my work with folks. Yeah, I was particularly impressed with just your reformulation of helping us understand that for people are uh, just trying so hard for connection and um, helping us just understand about the inexperience. And I think sometimes we all use strategies that have worked for us in the past. And I think sometimes people, those strategies can hurt a little bit and having the opportunity, maybe I see a nodding, so that's comforting, <laughs> but having the opportunity maybe to learn some maybe more effective or things that are a little bit less self-destructive sometimes can um, but having the space and the expertise to learn that, I just, I love how you highlighted the expense as well, that it's, you know, the, the strategies or the interventions you mentioned are super expensive, but you also balanced it out with helping us understand that, you know, hospital stays are very, very expensive. So in the end of the day, it's probably really. Um, well, safe. I think it saves so much money just to everybody, because if we can get individuals who are sick, like myself, who was on disability for, I think, five years at the end um being back into society as like working paying taxes living a fulfilling life volunteering like contributing back to society in so many different wonderful ways like i think that that's priceless in itself and going to school we had a little chat just before people came on so I just learned that you go back to school and have some good dreams to to like further that that's really cool thank you Debbie asks, it's very common to get a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. Uh, why do you think that is, she asks. Um, why it's so common to get both of them or either or? <laughs> well, I, I, Debbie, just the way it reads, it says very common to get a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and, and bipolar disorder. Why do you think that is? That was her question. 
Um, I would say because symptoms overlap so much. Uh, I know for me, um, that was the first one I got. And I think it was a lot uh, to do with my impulsivity and um, my highs and lows. And there wasn't, so this was like, wait, when was this? This would have been 97, I think. I was diagnosed bipolar. Um, and the, like, you only really see someone like, you don't see their whole life, right? And I think for a lot of people at the beginning, the big, big tipper was that interpersonal conflict. Huh. So if they have lots of partners or they keep losing friends or they keep firing doctors, then it, a lot of, I think, professionals are like, oh yeah, they, they have BPD or they're borderline or whatever. And I didn't have that experience. I was very, like, I have had the same psychiatrist for um, 21 years now. And um, like, I had a long-term partner for 12 years. Um, I I was still super close with my best friend. So we had a 20 plus year relationship. So I didn't like have that very common. So I think that is why um, they, for the longest time, put me in the bipolar category um but it was once I went into that actually that intensive um day treatment program for four months that they reassessed everything that was going on asked me in-depth questions about all this different stuff observed me for weeks and they're like yeah we think you have this Mm -hmm. this other one Um, but I think that there's so much overlap and even when talking to my psychiatrist about it she views it as a spectrum Mm -hmm. like bipolar and borderline personality are kind of like a spectrum. And so you can kind of go oscillate Mm -hmm. in that too, just because there is so much um, overlap. Um, The difference being that um, bipolar is primarily a a chemical imbalance, or at least that's what they like to say. I don't know, I haven't done a lot of research into it. My passion has become uh, BPD just based on my personal experience working in um, mental health and addictions. Um, I actually, to be honest, don't use the term BPD. I don't really share other than in this presentation. And then when I need to confront someone with a, doing something derogatory, I don't use it. I use the term mental health challenges. Um, I find that term allows me to feel like I can overcome my obstacles. Um, but that's not for everybody. Some people like really identify with mental illness, they feel like it's, um, yeah, it really captures the seriousness of it. Whereas like we all have mental health. So mental health challenges like aren't as serious, essentially. I'm thinking in their mind, that's how they view it. Um, I know for me for a long time, I really identified with um, my bipolar label. Um, But I think that's part of the like, not sure of who I was and what myself was. Um, And so I kind of wonder about other individuals who are like, I am bipolar or I am borderline or I am BPD. And I wonder if that's like, here someone has given them from an out, an external source, someone has given them like a label or a way of just grasping onto something. So that's why I talk about like, if somebody identifies that, that way with me, like they're talking like I am BPD, I am borderline. Um, I will respect that. Um, but I also query, is it, um, is it an artifact of the fact that, you know, it's sometimes easy to, when you don't know who you are and somebody with a professional title gives you this, this term, then you can take that on and feel kind of like I have a label, I found this and it's easy to connect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Selena, I hope that speaks to your question too, who asked, uh, could you speak more about the experiences of people with personality disorders? So thank you for that. Hopefully that, that uh, is, comes to your question. Erin uh, just adds about the, yeah, she was so busy listening. <laughs> she, it was hard to take notes, so I totally get that. That's always- I fun. also talk very fast, so I, uh, I, <laughs> I think I've slowed down. <laughs> like awesome. that's an improvement <laughs> from when the first wow. time I did. 
<laughs> and share that experience. So being Irish too, I always speak very quickly. So I've had to learn very much to be deliberate. So I get that. Um, yeah, so Sarah, I think adds something that I think is really vital. Uh, your presentation is very humanizing. Many people living with this condition are not yet able to verbalize their experience and are in survival mode and so much pain. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight that. I think it's not only beautifully said, but uh, you know, su supremely accurate, I would say too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kathleen adds, are you interested in sharing this experience elsewhere? I have a couple of peer groups that I think could benefit immensely from this knowledge and experience to share. So yes. yes. And I think at the end, you've left your email or if you just want to type it in as well, sure. um, go for it. Super. So people can get a hold of you. Uh, uh, Suzanne displayed a healthy vulnerable and uh, vulnerability, and that takes extreme courage. It makes the professional side that much more enriched, and the presenter has personal experience. So beautifully said, Erin. Thank you for that. Um, Rebecca asks, is the four-day, four-month day program in BC, or is that still available? I guess just asking a little bit more. Um, it's in Edmonton, so it's at the U of A um, hospital. Um, I don't know if it's still how much longer it's going to be available. I was actually in, invited to be um, on a improvement quality assessment of the program after I left it, which took about a year. Um, and then we did a presentation at the end. Um, but at that time too, the wait list was 18 months in order to get into it because the funding issues so they lost therapists like and like I said that's where that per cost um, comment comes from yes. is that um, I work in healthcare we have stats we have to make and if you're seeing the same you know 20 people every day for four months you're not going to be having as many stats as other people who are yeah. and that's like those 20 people with like how many therapists? I think we had six therapists in the room when we did the big group. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't think I, my recovery really started until I completed that in, when was it? October? November, November of 2016. And at the time, so this just kind of goes to how um, they're just trying, funding is chipping away. <laughs> Right. At, at programs because at the time I did it they had a vocational um, optional vocational like Fantastic. group afterwards yes so um, I took advantage of that and discovered like I wasn't ready to go back to work full time um, that I would be happier in human services than in my um, previous position in research administration in the university um so it was all really, really helpful. And I think if I hadn't have done that, I would have tried to go right back to work full time in um, research administration and fallen flat on my face again, because I just didn't know that I needed to slowly work things up and didn't realize how important purpose and meaning was in my life. I have to go to a job that I am so passionate about and um, that gets me up in the morning and it really fulfills that sense of self, right? That's how I've discovered my sense of self um, versus like number crunching at a university. <laughs> it's beautifully said, like I'm struck by how U of A were clearly following the evidence in terms of that additional vocational support for individuals for full recovery. So a shout out to them. I acknowledge it's no the longer there. Oh. That's too bad. That, that, that's fantastic that they were able to do that. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying about the finances and it getting chipped away and the cost per individual with six therapists. And sometimes these things are research projects and, you know, that's how they get started. And yeah, but yeah, I'm glad that you had that opportunity. But it does speak to that question about availability that uh, Rebecca mentions. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's why I like to acknowledge the immense amount of privilege that I've experienced because not everyone has has access to it and especially like I don't know what the wait list is now but it was 18 months last time I was involved with them which is very long and not really doable for people who are at like such extreme places in their right. life right right fair point yeah Victoria adds uh, I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder and relates so much to the BT uh, 
he, he, uh, the symptoms, thank you. I see some other recovery tools could be used to help bipolar disorder, at least mine, she says. So I'm not sure if you yeah. want to share. I think everybody, I think they should do dialectical behavioral therapy in elementary school. Like the mindfulness, the distress tolerance, like it gives you practical skills that really like breaks it down. And um, I use one of them is um, opposite action where you just, whatever your body and mind are saying to do, you do the opposite. <laughs> and I like, I consciously use it a lot because I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this work thing right now because it's stressing me out. And then I'm just like, do opposite. And then it, it helps, right? Because I get it done and suddenly the anxiety is not there. <laughs> so no, it gives you lots of like practical skills. I think there's tons of research on the um, internet. I would strongly suggest you read up on it. You check out the skills. Um, they do have like groups that are like called emotional regulation or distress tolerance groups. They're not the full DBT program, which is about a year long because yeah. The full one talks about like all 500 skills that they have, yeah. um, but the other ones are really pared down. And um, yeah, I think they're great. They're really great practical skills for everybody. Yeah, and Victoria's going, yes, 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 with a smiley at the end. So I <laughs> 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 hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria, for that. Uh, this question says, do you have suggestions on some of the best ways to support someone in the moment who's having difficulties with some symptoms of borderline personality disorder? Speaking from an occupational therapist or rehab assistant perspective from a mental health inpatient unit. Um, yes. <laughs> Can I formulate them right now? <laughs> It's hard to do that in the moment. That is a good question. I'm actually reading um, the book. Uh, hope, if you guys don't mind, do a plug for it. So thank you. I'm a loop. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I'm likely not. I apologize in advance. That's a new sound for me. Thank you for... Thank you for getting to that resource. I appreciate that. Um, it's called In the Fullness of Time, Recovery from Borderline Personality Disorder. And this is the, um, the Mary, I know it's backwards, uh, Zanari. That's how I say it. I don't know if that's how you're supposed to. But, um, and so she's done longitudinal research for, I think they're going on 22 years. And she talks about um, ways like, I don't always agree with the language in the books I read because they use language like there is a talk. She actually gives like good, um, I guess, strategy of like putting it in the middle. So if someone's like, nobody loves me, you wouldn't say, well, somebody loves you. Um, that's not true or something. You'd be like, yeah, sometimes people do feel that way. And you put it kind of in the middle distance. So it's not on you, it's not on them, you kind of, and it's almost safer that way. So it's not confronting the individual with their distorted thoughts. It's kind of like planting that seed there. <laughs> and then just going with, yeah. with the like validation of like, yeah, sometimes people feel that way. It, it must be very distressing or that seems like a really hard emotion to be sitting with right now. Yeah. Thank you. I, that's, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's exactly what I was saying. Just the validation as well that it gives, but it leaves the door open and not personalized to say, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The other thing I would suggest is try not to be neutral in your interactions. <laughs> I think I've come to the realization that the reason I'm so bubbly and over the top and like smiling and nah, 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 with my face is just, um, I think it's a response to making sure everybody knows how I'm feeling and communicating that I'm not angry at them or mad or whatever. Because like I said, even yesterday, I'll give the example when I said, like, I still struggle with some of those traits yesterday. Um, I went to work and my coworker was talking to another coworker and she looked, um, I, my assumption based on her face was she was mad at me. <laughs> like that was just my automatic assumption because she didn't smile. She was like concentrated on talking 
the two of them were talking about some work thing. And I kind of like came in the door and they kind of looked at me and then like, and I was like, oh God, everybody hates me. <laughs> and so I had to be like, wait a minute, like, nope, that isn't what's happening. But my mind, my amygdala and my limbic system just automatically went to that. It's like, oh, threat, threat, um, high alert. And so I consciously still have to work on re training my brain not to do it. It definitely isn't um, like as bad as it used to be. Like I'm sure in the past I would have just walked away or like done something. Um, but now I'm like able to be like, oh, okay, I feel it. Nope, we're gonna fight that. <laughs> and then just go on. That's such a powerful, um, a, such a powerful way to learn. Thank you, Suzanne. That's a really helpful, concrete uh, example. Thank you very much. Jim and Suzanne, your presentation's gold, real and resonating, insightful and engaging. Many, many thanks for being you. Nice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Kathleen adds on the topics of books and resources for individuals diagnosed with BPD or working with those with BPD. Marcia Lyonhan's bibliography was incredibly powerful for me, knowing the work she has done stemmed from her own lived experience and hearing the growth, healing and recovery that she's obtained was incredibly empowering as are you, um, Suzanne. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think she had a lot of really great, um, like she's done so much work. I couldn't get through the biography because she kept using the term committed suicide. Was what? Oh, she kept committed. using the term committed suicide and that's a really big yeah. um, okay. trigger for me. Absolutely, yes. So, um, yeah. but Absolutely. yeah, I, yeah, I just couldn't read that that resource, but I'm glad that it was helpful. And I think all of the work that she's done is so incredibly yeah. powerful. And I'm so thankful that she came out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm so thankful that she came out later in life and talked about that because yeah. yeah. there yeah. was a long period of time where she didn't at all. Right. And they were like, there was um, a long period of time where we weren't any talking about any of that material. I remember when her work came on, um, you know, became available. I, I was a, a person in direct service delivery at that point. And I think it was like a breath of fresh air for many of us. It's like, okay, here's something tangible. Here's something we can do to support individuals in a very real way. I also found her very approachable. So she, I remember we, I, we lived in Vancouver at the time, we took her to come to speak to us many times. And she was just, uh, yeah, she was like a breath of fresh air, as I say, like yourself, like she just, this is how it is. And this seems to help. <laughs> like no mystery no like just lift the fog and it's like well this is what we're dealing with and this yeah I I would love like it would be a dream come true to meet her but um yeah so it's not like so I don't mean to like poo poo on the biography I just yeah like I still I, I, think yeah. very highly of her it just for me was not the That's right it combination of words used <laughs> and I don't recall when that was published honestly but I know definitely we have done a lot of work in the last five seven years around that term that just understand the implication and I get yeah and I haven't read the book I love you or I hate you don't leave me okay heavy for that resource as well I appreciate that thank you yeah so here's a question. When you changed careers, did you access any resources or support services such as employment services? Uh, I didn't, other than the vocational um, program. I just applied to jobs. And um, I actually, my first job after um, recovery was with uh, CMHA Edmonton. So I got like a casual, um, like I think it was advertised as 15 hours a week job helping other people um, with practical things like going grocery shopping and going to doctor's appointments and but using your still like using your lived experience uh, in in the conversations that you had with them yeah. and so that was really um, helpful for me because yeah. it gave me the flexibility then to continue to go to um, follow-up group which from that uh, four-month program they have a follow-up group which is once a week for an hour you can go to this group for the rest of your life it's yeah. it's open to you for the rest of your life as long as you've completed the four months um so I did that for another year after um I left the program 
So it really gave me the flexibility to concentrate on continuing to build up my skills in recovery without overwhelming myself with work. And um, I was also lucky to have Canadian disability pension at the time, and they allowed me to get top up hours, as well as I had my parents who were able to help me a bit. But I think like, I think it's just like looking back, I think my success, part of my success was on the fact that I financially I had money to live at a safe place to live. Um, and I was able to focus on my recovery while adding different aspects into my life so that now I can work full time and give back. And I work full time. I do stuff like this as a volunteer. I don't get paid to do these talks or anything like that. Uh, I volunteer on actually a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, so I think it's just a testament to how much we really need to invest in housing and the time and the financial, like the basic income to allow people to make the steps at the time that they can versus just leaving them. And that's how we end up with that revolving door of people with hospitalizations. Erin mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, says, you nailed it, Suzanne. <laughs> I think the one person was just talking about, they asking questions about the vocational support and they were asking, was that follow-up individual or group, for, group format? It was, Group, okay. it was group, so once a week. Um, so we had to complete 120 hours in six weeks. Uh -huh. And so once a week we had to, we went to a group. So not everybody from the program ended up doing it. So I think there was just less than 10 of us who opted into that. Um, and yeah, every week we just got to talk about like, what were some of the problems we were experiencing? Um, what were like, or I guess, what were some of the challenges and barriers we were experiencing in doing this? Um, for me, I think the biggest lesson I learned from that was that I wasn't ready to go back to full-time work. So I thought like, I got a volunteer position because it's all volunteers. So you have to get a volunteer position. Um, I got a volunteer position in human services, actually with E. Fry, Elizabeth Fry Society oh, yes. in Edmonton yeah. Yeah. as a court worker. And I thought, okay, I can do this full time. Because they were like, well, we'll just pair you with an actual court worker since you're volunteering. We're not paying you. So you can work as much as you want. And I totally was like, yeah, I'm going to work yeah. full time. And then at the end of the six weeks, they were like, you know, if you were an actual employee, this would have been like, we understand a lot was going on for you during your six weeks. And, and, you know, so it wasn't a trouble. It wasn't a problem that you couldn't come all the time. But if this were an actual employment place, this would not have, like, we don't think that you're ready for full time employment at this time. So that was really, really helpful. And so from that, then I restricted what I was looking for to part time. You're a good so, woman yeah. to be able to hear that feedback and, and live it. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. No, oh, it's great. It was delivered in a very kind, caring oh, way. That's, well, well done to both of you. That's my <laughs> point. Well done. Um, so I realize it's 11.53. And let's just, Laura says, uh, thank you so much for insightful responses. Being an inpatient unit, I've worked closely with a few clients that have difficulties with borderline personality disorder. And one in particular who I was very close with, and she had very difficult time not resorting to self-harm in the unit and at home. Is there anything you can suggest to try when self-harm is so prevalent for somebody? No. <laughs> I think it's just about um, harm reduction, right? Um, I work with a social worker. I, we actually run um, a DBT group for young adults together. And he says, I would rather you self-harm than take your life. And I think that that is extremely like poignant because it is a coping mechanism um, to not go to that next step. Right. Um, so I think it's all about harm reduction. So can we get you from doing this amount or this self-harm to doing this one? Or can we at least make sure that you're using clean supplies um, or bandaging yourself or all this different stuff? And I think that distress tolerance piece in the DBT is so incredibly important because that is dealing with those urges, right? So how do we deal with that distress that it gets so intense that we end up harming ourselves? Yeah. How can, there's all these other strategies that we can use. Thank you very much for that, cherished. 
feedback. Yeah. Jeff Ooh. adds, Ella, uh, the idea to work on trying to do the opposite was really valuable and practical. Do you have any other tips that worked for you? That's from Jeff. Mm, opposites. Um, radical acceptance. No, radical acceptance and self-compassion. <laughs> Those are the two big things. Accepting that the world sucks <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, there's things that bring me joy in life and all of that. So that's a dialectical thinking, how I can be pissed off at my parents from my childhood and what happened in my childhood and still love them. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, and I carry that anger to this day and it probably will never go away. Um, I, in my mind, I not going to forgive them for what happened, but that doesn't change the fact that I still love them and we have a good relationship now. Um, so trying to remember not extremes and, um, as well as self-compassion in that I was doing the best I could with knowledge I had at the time. Mm -hmm. I know more now I can do differently now. Mm -hmm. um, and just, yeah, just, yeah. Being kind to myself a hundred percent. If I don't feel like I can sweep the floor, then I just view it as, okay, today is not the day to sweep the floor. I will get to it. It will happen. <laughs> or we'll stay there for another day or two. It's all good. Excellent. Yeah. So we have a question from Natasha who would like to connect with you about social work. So maybe we'll leave that between you guys. That's a, a, a rather personal thing, maybe. Um, I'm just wondering about your journey in social work and what courses you did and so forth. So maybe we'll just leave that with Natasha. And um, I would put my email address in sure. the chat. So Appreciate feel free. Sure. Um, yeah. To email Rebecca me. adds wonderful presentation. I really appreciate you and this presentation. Shirley asks, having supported or affordable housing makes a huge difference for anybody with a serious mental illness. You made the point of how important it is uh, that we as a society provides what needed. Thank you for that comment, Shirley. Michael asks, will the webinar be available? Absolutely, will be available in the archives on the psyrehab.ca. Uh, yep. And Selena adds, here's a link to the video from Family Smart about how to support those experiencing self-harm. That's fantastic, Selena. Thank you so much. Um, Carly adds, harm reduction is a big piece of the way forward for my daughter, she adds. Thank you. And you've added your email. Thank you. There's uh, likely going to be someone in your life who uh, thinks less of you than what you are. Don't let that person be you. Oh, that's so nicely said, isn't it, Jim? Wow. Good job. Thank you so much for the presentation and all the resources and your passion in this area is amazing and so valuable. Thank you. It's 11.58, so I just, I just want to make sure that I get to everybody's comment. Fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you, Natalie. That's very sweet of you. Uh, yeah. uh, last. Thank you for coming, everybody. I appreciate um, that you came. I appreciate your interest, and um, that's really important. And I hope um, that I've sparked some sort of fire in you to carry on my passion. <laughs> out there in the world and that we can like it takes everybody working together to change discrimination and stigma and so I really really appreciate that you were able to come today and listen to my talk and um, take something away from it that's the real goal behind this really this is why I do it because um, I, I yeah I just I can't fight this by myself <laughs> And I need you guys, I need you guys to come on board with me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so one person as, asks for your email address again, I can just cut, copy and paste, that's no problem. I also please ask you to fill out the evaluation. I realized that when I posted that, there's an error in the description, I apologize, uh, but the content of the evaluation is correct. Um, so I did send it earlier on that link and uh, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I'm just going to cop and paste that again as we're doing this last chat here and ask you to please fill it out. So just ignore the first two pages, but everything else is correct. And it's because I did it at the last minute, but it's easier to get it to you now than it is later. So um, yeah, sorry for taking time to do this. My eyes are not working quickly enough. There we go. I got it finally. Yeah. So as I say, just please ignore that first. Uh, whoops. So everybody, please ignore that first one, the first two pages, and please just fill it out. Thank you kindly. Super. 
good. 12 o'clock, look at us. That's amazing. What a great presentation, Suzanne. I think you've really helped us take something that I know as a clinician, sometimes I was fearful because I felt I didn't have the skill sometimes that maybe I was going to make things worse or maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I would mess it up. I, I definitely felt like that on days. So I think you've taken something that, that, um, can, you know, just, I felt I didn't have skills and you've just yeah. named a lot of stuff and you've helped me think about it. And I, yeah. really I think the thing that we often forget is that we can go back and apologize. We can admit that we're wrong and almost that is even better because we're modeling that skill, yeah. right? We're saying, Oh, you know what? I fucked up. I didn't see the right thing. Sorry <laughs> to you. Um, and you know what, that was my bad. Why don't you, like, why don't we try this again? And they talk about that when you do the assist um, training, this um, applied suicide intervention skills right. training. Yes. Yeah. And they talk about that relationship and how you get in sync. But sometimes you you screw it up yeah. and you get out of sync and it's no so people. easy to get back in. Oh, no more people, right? Like that's just, but I think when people agree to stay in relationship with each other to work through that that is a gift for both people not just one person but both yeah definitely yeah 